Hello. Have you ever been in a season in your life that you thought would just never end? One problem, one tragedy after another, and it just seems to go on and on and on, and no matter how much you pray, no matter how hard you try, things just sometimes seem to go from bad to worse. Well, David is still in that cycle. Today, he's still on the run, but by our conclusion today, he's going to start to see a little bit of light, a little bit of hope. When we left in the last session, Absalom had captured Jerusalem. Actually, it wasn't a great big capture. There was no warfare involved. He just walked in and took the city. Along with him was David's former advisor, Ahithophel. The man that they said when he spoke, it was like hearing an oracle of God because every word he said, even though it wasn't true, didn't come from God, seemed to be that way. And so Absalom had listened to Ahithophel last time and had taken all of David's concubines. Now he was ready to move on for, for the war and he needed more advice. So he calls Ahithophel and he said, you know, what do you think we should do? Ahithophel comes up with a great idea. I mean, he has now fortified himself and all of the fellow conspirators and so he proposes a plan to take David in a very prompt decisive action before David's forces can get together, have time to plan, regroup, rest, get over their shock. And he says, here's what we'll do. He says, this is Ahithophel, let me choose 12,000 men. I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him. I will strike only the king and I will bring back to you the people. Well, could have gone two ways, that advice. One, with Absalom thinking, oh, I don't have a thing to do. It's everything's in capable hands. He will take care of it, and I'll just sit back, and my kingdom will progress. Or it could have gone the other way. What am I going to be doing, and you're going to get the glory? Well, Absalom and his council decide, hey, you know, this really does sound like a good advice we should probably take it. But in verses five through 14, young Absalom, even though he's pleased with the advice, he thinks maybe he better get a second opinion. See, he listened to Ahithophel before about taking the concubines, no aftershocks, no waves, everything was fine. But this is a bigger deal. This would really bring the kingdom to the forefront or it would, could actually tear it apart. And so Absalom calls for Hoshei, who was David's friend and also another advisor. But he had tricked Absalom into thinking that he was on Absalom's side now. And maybe Absalom just wants to test Hoshei's loyalty and find out what he's like, see if he's really going to stand up for him, see if he really knows how to get advice. So he calls him in and says, you know, Ahithophel has said, you know, attack now, do it at night, let's get it done. Hushai, here's that plan. And he knows that if they do that, this could very well be the end of David and the end of David's campaign. And so he says, well, last time the advice that Ahithophel gave was very good and very sound. But this time, I think there's a mistake. And so he proceeds to dwell on all of the warlike qualities of David and his character, the military experience that both David and all of his men have. And saying, you're wanting to go, with, go to him at night? Hey, 
this is a warrior. He has spent his life, he's a veteran. He knows better than to stay with the men, lest he be captured and die. As a matter of fact, he's probably hiding in some stronghold now where you'll never find him. And also, think about this, O king. Should you lose even a very small number of men, what would happen? Word would get out that the armies of Absalom has been defeated and you would lose support and you would look bad. What Hushai was really saying was, we need to get a larger army from throughout Israel. Let's go out and you gather the men. They will come to you. Go all the way from Dan to Beersheba. This was real wisdom on the part of Hushai because he knew in order to do this, it would take Absalom time. And it would give David the one thing that he needed at that point, time. Also, Hushai advised Absalom, don't send someone else. You yourself go as the leader. You go as the commander, the one in charge. And that way, after David's defeated, you will get the glory and not someone else. Everyone will look to you. Otherwise, they'll all look to Ahithophel and think that the glory belongs to him. Well, Hushai's reasons seem very plausible, and he played up the danger of the immediate attack, while at the same time, he appealed to the cowardly self-interest of Absalom and all of his followers. So in following Absalom, in flattering Absalom's pride and ambition, the bait was taken. The council declared in favor of Hushai. Absalom postponed attack meant David had opportunity to regroup. And you might say, boy, he was really smart to outsmart Ahithophel. Now, the real reason for this is found in verse 14. It says, the Lord, God himself, determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel. See, the first plan was good. It would have worked. David would have been defeated, but God determined that that advice would be defeated. So the outcome of the war was decided before even the very first blow was fought. And why would God make a decision like this? Well, it goes back to chapter 15 and verse 31. As soon as David heard that Ahithophel had switched sides. In 2 Samuel 15, 31, he said, And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. David didn't know how it was going to work out. He didn't know if Ahithophel was suddenly going to have brain freeze, if the plan he gave just might not work, if it would be rejected. He didn't know. And so we come to our first principle today. God does not need our supervision to answer prayer. Oh, that's a big one. It's okay for you to pray and trust God. Take your hands off and know that he will answer the prayer in a way that you haven't imagined and a way that you haven't directed. That's why Romans 8.26 says, because we don't know how to pray, we pray in the Spirit. We pray asking God to just take over and do the right thing. Do what is needed on our behalf because 828 in Romans goes on to say, all things work together for good for us who love the Lord. And so we're, when we pray in the Spirit, we're saying, God, I, I don't know how it's going to work out and I don't need to know. All I need to know is that I can trust you and that you're going to answer prayers. And that's what David did. So, in verses 15 through 22 of 
Second Samuel 17, we see that Hushai sent out secret intelligence to David. Hushai may have doubted that his advice would be completely followed, knowing Absalom's volatile temperament, or he may have thought, you know, I can't be with him every minute, and that old Ahithophel might get to him again. So let me get word to David quickly. And that's what he did. Abathar and Zadok, the two priests, had their sons there in Jerusalem. They'd been sent there for the very purpose of getting word back to David, should something happen that he needed to know. David wanted to be kept informed of what the enemy was going to do so that he could make his plans. Hushai gathered together the two young priests, Jonathan and Hamaaz, and he said, go and tell David the plan and tell him to cross the Jordan immediately. Do not stay on this side of the Jordan because Absalom is on his way. On their way to David, they ran into a problem. The only way that Hushai could get word to the two young priests was through a servant girl. She met them. While she was meeting them, while a servant girl was meeting them, a lad happened to see them. And he went to report to Absalom and his soldiers. So the two young men found a man's house that had a well, a dry well. They hid inside of that. Then when the soldiers came, a woman of the house came out and said, oh, yeah, I remember seeing them, and she misdirected them. Once the soldiers were gone, they were free. So what do we have in this short story between verses 15 and 22? We have the priests who are named. They need help. Those priest sons need help. But we have a female servant, a lad, a man, a woman. Many unnamed people impact our lives. You will go through life and people that you'll never know their names because you'll, ne you'll never have opportunity to really make acquaintance with them. Maybe it's just someone in passing. They will impact your life by something they do or try to do to you or for you. And it's important for us to recognize, even as Hebrews said, that sometimes we entertain strangers unaware. There's many people that God puts in our path. We don't know who they are, but they're there for a purpose. And so the priest, after it was clear, they knew it was clear, they came up from the well and they found David. And they told David the message. They said, this is Absalom's plan. And Hushai said, it's very, very important for you to cross the Jordan River as quickly as you can. Cross it before the night is over. Though the Jordan was not a large river, it could be dangerous if not crossed properly. David found the place for he and all of his people, all of his soldiers, the mighty men, the little children to, cr to go across safely so that by the morning's light, there was not a single soul of David's followers on that side of Jordan. But this had to be a very emotional time for David. You see, back Hundreds of years before that, Joshua had divided the land of Israel among all the tribes. And while it included both sides of the River Jordan, it was always emotionally understood by the people that the real land of Israel was on the west side of Jordan. 
and here Josh, here David was. He's having to cross over the Jordan. And probably at this point, David felt as though he were really in exile. It was even be later after the war with Absalom was over that the enemies of Israel would accuse him of having fled the land in chapter 19 because they realized that by going over Jordan, he was le leaving what so many people of Israel, what so many Jews call the real Israelites. It was shortly after this, Ahithophel in verse 23 realizes what's happened. He saw that his advice was not followed. That wounded Ahithophel's vanity and his pride. But more than that, his humiliation was aggravated by the conviction caused that because this delay has happened, David will have time to plan. David will have time to gather support. David will have time to strengthen himself and all those followers. David will win the war. With that realization came another fact that Ahithophel knew very well. He knew that once this coming storm of vengeance came to a close, that all or much of the responsibility would fall upon him as the instigator, as the one who held things together. And David would not allow him to live. So, absol so Ahithophel committed a very rare crime in Israel especially in the Old Testament, he committed suicide. He hung himself because he could not endure the disgrace, the rejection, and because he foresaw that David would gain time and strength and in all probability be victorious and he would be put to death. The story of David parallels the New Testament story. Many times the life of David has been compared to the life of Christ, especially during this time when we had seen him go up the Mount of Olives in tears because he was being rejected by the people. Well, during the same time period that Jesus was rejected by the people, it was because of one man, Judas. And that one man, Judas, took the very same way out that Ahithophel did. He also decided that he would hang himself. Perhaps before then, like Ahithophel, Judas had been regarded as the wise one of the simple disciples, as he was the one to make the money decisions and do so much. But their story ended the same. They both rejected their master. They both chose a different way. They both chose a life that would elevate them, put themselves ahead of others, thinking of only their f themselves and how they could use others. And both their lives ended in tragedy. Well, the chapter ends up with Absalom and his troops advancing. And we don't know how long this period was. It had to be long enough for Absalom to send messengers out throughout the land of Israel and to call the soldiers together from all the tribes willing to support him. And it had to be time enough for them to arrive in Jerusalem, set their affairs in order at home so they could leave and come up with some sort of training at if not how to fight, at least what we're going to do. Absalom also discovered that I need a commander of this army. So he chose Amasa. Now, 
The thing about Amasa is his mother was Abigail. Well, you say, well, who, who is Abigail? We haven't, that's not David's wife that he had married before, no. Abigail was a sister of Zariah and the sister of David. So this gave Absalom's captain the same relationship to David that Joab had. Joab and Amasa were both nephews of David, which made both Joab and Amasa cousins to Absalom. This is a confused family affair. Do you ever feel like your family is just sort of like this? We're just running together and no wonder they're calling it the Civil War because it could have been a family feud as well. The last verses, David flees to Mahanahem. Now, David's reputation was still intact in North Gilead. And when he arrived at this fortified city of Mahanaim, he found a very warm reception. But this was a strange place for him to run. You see, after King Saul's death, his only surviving son, Abishabeth, had gone to this very same city and made it his capital. You think, why in the world would David want to go there? Well, this was a strong city with a mountainous district all around it. And it was a good place for retreat, just in case of need. And there were a lot of warlike people who were very friendly to David. Also, just like the area where Absalom had chosen, it's a place known for its forest. Here the supporters gathered around David. And the, while the wealthy, influ, influential heads of clans declared themselves in his favor and they supplied necessities, three different people are mentioned which really represent the broad category. The first one is Shobai, and he is from the people of Abnon. Back in chapter 11, his brother, Hun, Hun, Hanan, decided that after his father died, he was not going to receive help from David. <clears throat> and so when David's ambassadors came to help him out, he listened to his friends and he really embarrassed those men. He cut off their beards, he cut off their robes and sent them home and says, I don't need you. Well, David took offense to that, came and conquered the land. And he made Shobai in his place a vassal king of Ammon, but under the rulership of David. Great principle here. David treated Shobai with respect, with honor, when he did not have to. Then, when David could not give that any longer, we see that Shobai is still faithful to him. You be kind to people when you don't have to be. Then they will be kind to you when you need it. The second one was Makar from Lodibar. Mm. This also is a former supporter of Saul and associated with Ibishef. But more importantly, Lodibar. Micah, that is where Mephibosheth had stayed after his nurse ran away with him and he became a cripple. He stayed there in the land of Lodabar. And Lodabar means a land with no pasture or without bread. He'd stayed in this land where he could not excel, where he could not grow. And he was living in the house of Makar. And that's this very same Makar whose name means 
sold, to tumble into ruins, to perish, to be brought low, and to decay. Here we see one representing the people that have nothing to give, the poor, the needy. They came to David with nothing to offer but themselves. And we have to recognize that even when we are downcast, even when we are at our worst and we think, I can't go on another day, there are still people that need us. Because Michael realized you helped Mephibosheth when he was in this state. You were kind to the house of Saul. You can help me. I believe in you and I believe your state will not be what it always is. And so no matter how bad your circumstances may be, realize that God may set people in your path. They're not there because they can help you. They can't do anything but say, I'll pray for you, I'll support you, and believe me, that's a lot. Their purpose in coming is for you at some point to be able to help them. And when you are elevated, because that's what God will do to you, to also help raise them out of their poor state. The third person was Barzillai, the Gileite. This is one of my favorite people in the Bible. I just love this guy. He, he's an 80-year-old wealthy landowner. And he, he's a friend with po- property and honor, but his age and his infirmities did not keep him from making the trip to find David. He was not going to let anything stop him. No matter where David was, he was going to follow him even after David's victory that we'll get to next week. Barzillai was there and he says, I'm going to support you all the way back to the river. I'm going to take you where you are going. And then when it came to the river, he said, no, he said, look, I'm not going to be a burden. I just want you to know I love you and I support you. We need friends like that. And here's our final principle as we close. Friends can be found even in enemy territory. We need to see people as individuals. We need to recognize who they are. Whether they're people that we have helped in the past and we have been kind to them, and they're standing with us because now they have that opportunity to repay us. Or whether they're the poor who can do absolutely nothing for us, but they're hanging on in hopes that we can somehow, someday, do something for them, or whether they're like that wealthy Barzillai, that 80-year-old man who said, I'm here, I can help you, I can support you, and I have bought necessities for you and your clan. God has put people in your path. Open your eyes, see who they are, and ask God how You can not only be blessed, but be a blessing as you walk on your journey.